a debate on free trade agreements for Colombia, Panama, and South Korea. If members use all time for debates, they'll vote on those measures tonight at about 10 Eastern. And now to live U.S. Senate here on C-SPAN 2. Senate will come to order. The chaplain, Dr. Barry Black, will lead the Senate in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, whose glory has been revealed through the generations, renew within our senators a true understanding of your purpose for their lives, for our nation, and for our world. Amid the challenges of our time, infuse them with a spirit of wisdom and courage so that they will be instruments of your providence. Lord, use them to make an impact on the lives of the forgotten who lack hope and on all people who seek your presence. May your grace, mercy, and peace be on us all now and stay with each one of us always. We pray in your sacred name. Amen. Please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Clerk will read a communication to the Senate. Washington, D.C., October 12, 2011, to the Senate. On the provisions of Rule 1, Paragraph 3 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, I hereby appoint the Honorable Kirsten E. Gillibrand, a senator from the state of New York, to perform the duties of the chair, son Daniel K. Noway, President Pro Tempore. Madam President. Majority Leader. Following Leader remarks, the Senate will begin consideration of the free trade agreements. There are three of them. There will be up to 12 hours of debate on these matters. The Senate will have their normal recess from 12.30 till 2.15 today for our caucus meetings. We expect to yield back some of the time, I certainly hope so, on the trade agreements, although uh, the people can speak as much as they want on these matters. But we are going to complete the action tonight, whether it's at 4 o'clock or midnight. We're going to complete action on these bills today. The uh, House is waiting our action. Ms. Madam President, H.R. 2681 is the desk, and it's due for a second reading. Clerk will read the title of the bill for the second time. H.R. 2681, an act to provide additional time for the Administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency to issue achievable, achievable standards for cement manufacturing facilities and for other purposes. I would object to any further proceedings at this time, Madam President. Objection having been heard. It will be placed on the calendar under Rule 14. I ask unanimous consent that following, the following members who are staff members of various senators uh, be granted four privileges during the consideration of the Columbia, Panama, and South Korea trade agreement legislation. Specifically, the Chairman of the Finance Committee's uh, staff members, Jane Beard, Sarah Babcock, Danielle Fiddler, Laura Jaskiriski, Stephen Simpson, Jonathan Goldman, Nick Malinak, and Cosimo Foley. Objection. Madam President, Republican obstructionism was once again in evidence last night, and it's cost this nation millions of jobs. Last night, 
Republicans blocked the Americans Job Act. President Obama's plan to create two million jobs by giving tax cuts to businesses and middle class families and investing in modern roads, bridges and schools. It's not the first jobs bill they've blocked this Congress, although I hope it'll be the last. But it seems as if the Republicans don't really want to put Americans back to work. They believe a weak economy means a weak president. So even though they've supported each piece of the American Job Act in the past, they blocked this job creating legislation in the hopes of doing political damage to the president. But we've not given up on creating jobs in America and will not let Republican political games stand between Congress and its most important duty to put 14 million Americans back to work. Passing the Jobs Act would have been a step in the right direction. Economists of every stripe agree it would have impacted the economy immediately and put up to two million people back to work. Mark Zandi, chief economist at Moody's and the economic advisor of Senator John McCain's presidential campaign said this, quote, given the high odds of another recession in the next few months, it's vital for Congress and the administration to provide some near-term support to the economy, close quotes. Zandi says that the American jobs market could shave a percentage point off the unemployment rate. Conversely, he warned that without immediate action, the likelihood was high of a double-dip recession. So the last thing we should be doing right now is wasting time, but that's what Republicans are forcing us to do. Last night, a majority of the Senate voted to take up this bill. But Republicans won't put politics aside for a moment, even when the price of their stubbornness is struggling families and failing businesses. I say it again, Democrats are not going to give up on creating jobs. We'll introduce the American Jobs Act piece by piece. I had two conversations last night while the vote was taking place with Republicans, and both Republican senators said they would like to join uh, in moving some pieces of this legislation. So we're going to do that, and I'm glad to see there's some interest by my Republican colleagues in doing that. Many of the ideas we'll advance will be proposals Republicans have supported in the past, as I've already indicated. And I think that they'll have to explain to the American people at a time of record unemployment why they continue to oppose job-creating tax cuts for small businesses and the middle class and other proposals that they've supported in the past. So as I said a minute ago, I look forward to working with my Republican colleagues in moving forward parts of this bill that they like. At the end of the day, uh, if they don't do this, the motive will be crystal clear, politics. So I hope Republicans will be able to see past partisan posturing to support their own past proposals when we consider them individually in the next few weeks. Take, for example, the payroll tax cut. Uh, my friend, the Republican leader, has supported payroll tax cuts in the past. Most Republicans have. This is what my friend, the Republican leader, said about the same tax cut in 2009, I quote, would put a lot of money back in the hands of businesses, in the hands of individuals. Republicans, generally speaking, from Maine to Mississippi, likes tax relief, end of quote. So that's part of the American Jobs Act. Another senator sponsored a bill to give tax, Republican senator, sponsored a bill to give tax credits to businesses that hire out-of-work out of veterans. Yet that same Republican senator voted against the same proposal last night. It was part of the bill last night. Republicans have supported these proposals in the past. They should have supported them yesterday. But Democrats care so much about creating jobs that we'll give our Republican colleagues another opportunity to do the right thing. And we'll move forward in the best way that we can to put these matters before the American people, if necessary, piece by piece. Mr. President, today um, we have worked hard to be in the posture that we're in today, to have votes on these um, trade bills. Uh, my friends, the Republican leaders heard me say this too much, but I don't favor these bills. But the majority of this Senate does, and I felt that it was important that we move these forward. I've worked with the Republican leader to do it today. I think it's important to do it today. We have the President of Korea, who, who is here in America. He's going to speak to a joint session of Congress tomorrow. And I look forward to a very productive day in moving these matters forward. Madam President. Republican Leader. Before my friend, the Majority Leader, uh, leaves the floor, let me just uh, remind him and our Senate colleagues and the American people that Republicans were prepared to vote on the President's second 
version of the stimulus bill last night. In fact, I offered uh, consent that we have that vote, not the motion to proceed to it, but the actual vote. Uh, I would not going to renew that request at the, at the moment, but just would say to my friend, we, we are happy to have that vote. We're happy to have it last night. With regard to the pieces of it, my friend is correct. Some of, it, of the pieces of this second stimulus might well be appropriate. I've recommended to the uh, Joint Select Committee that he and I appointed 50 percent of it. They take a look at some of the pieces of it, which could well be included in a product that we're going to get before Thanksgiving, before the Senate and House. So um, again, I would be happy to vote on the entire package. We was, were happy to do it last night and also uh, happy to look at pieces of it. We do have, as the Majority Leader and I have discussed before, important work to do on the, uh, here in the Senate. We've got the trade agreements that we're going to approve tonight. Uh, we've got three appropriation bills that we're going to go to after that. Uh, the basic work of government, which we haven't done in the last few years that the American people would like to see us do. Uh, and we've got a joint select committee set up that could look at parts of the proposal that the majority leader is referring to. So I have uh, some optimism that we'll be able to come together on pieces of it that we think make sense. I will say that as far as I know, there's not a single Republican who thinks it's a good idea to raise taxes on over 300,000 business owners, which is what would happen under the so-called millionaire surtax. So there are parts of it that we very much disagree with. Uh, we have divided government. Uh, neither party controls the entire government. We'll only be able to pass those things that we do agree upon. And I think there are parts of the package that my friend refers to that could well be agreed to at some point this year on a bipartisan basis. So Madam President, uh, if I may, um, let me um, just turn to my uh, prepared remarks. Uh, later uh, today, the Senate will show that Democrats and Republicans can, in fact, work together to make it easier for American businesses to create jobs. By passing free trade agreements with Colombia and Panama and South Korea, we will help the economy and we'll put the, uh, put the lie to the ridiculous Obama campaign claim that Republicans are somehow rooting against the economy. Nothing could be more uh, ridiculous and absurd as to suggest that Republicans are somehow rooting against our economy. The fact of the matter is, if President Obama were willing to work with us on a more bipartisan piece of legislation like this, nobody would even be talking about a dysfunctional Congress. There wouldn't be any reason to. But as we all know, that doesn't fit in with the president's reelection strategy. The White House has made it clear that the president is praying for gridlock. He's actually hoping for gridlock. So he has somebody besides himself to point the finger at next November. That's a big mistake. The American people will not tolerate their own president putting politics ahead of working with Congress on the kind of bipartisan legislation that we know both parties could agree on right now. So this morning, I'd like to repeat my call to the president to put the political playbook aside and work with us instead on the kind of bipartisan job-creating legislation that the American people truly want. The trade bills we'll be voting on tonight are a good start. There's no reason we should have to wait nearly three years for this president to send them up to Congress for a vote. But they're a good start nonetheless. Three years late, but still very important to do. Now let's move on to some other things. We've uh, pointed to areas like regulatory reform, tax reform, and energy exploration, where the parties could help create jobs without raising taxes or adding to the deficit. It's just the kind of bipartisan cooperation that the American people are actually demanding from us. And what I'm saying this morning is that Republicans are eager and willing to join Democrats in making that happen. The presidential election, for goodness sake, is 13 months away. 13 months from now is the presidential election. There's plenty of time to campaign. Why don't we put that off for a while and do what we were sent here to do? But right now, we've got an opportunity to work together. Let's put aside the political playbook and focus on results. 
Now, I know that doesn't come easy for some around here. The senior senator from New York, for example, made it pretty clear yesterday that he's more interested in drawing a contrast with Republicans than he is in actually passing bipartisan legislation that we know will spur job growth. But I don't believe the 14 million Americans looking for work right now care about more about contrast than about jobs. And the jobs crisis we're in calls for lawmakers to rise above these games. Americans expect us to do something to help create jobs. That's what we should be doing. And that's why Republicans will continue to seek out Democrats who are more interested in jobs than in political posturing and work with them on a bipartisan legislation like the trade bills we'll vote on tonight. What we will not do, though, is vote in favor of any more misguided stimulus bills because some bill writer slapped the word jobs on the cover page. A stimulus bill with the word jobs slapped on the cover page wrapped around a talking point tax hike is not our idea of what is good for America. And we refuse to raise taxes on the very people Americans are depending on to create jobs. We need to be looking for ways to make it easier to create jobs, not harder. For nearly three years, Republicans have told Democrats again and again that we're willing and eager to work with the Democrats anywhere, anytime on real job-promoting legislation that both sides could agree on. I've been calling on the President to approve these three free trade agreements since the day he took the oath of office. All the President had to do was to follow through on these agreements and send them up to Congress and we have, would have had an early bipartisan achievement that didn't add a single dime to the deficit, that would have convinced people the two sides could work together, and that by the President's own assessment created tens of thousands of jobs right here at home. But he didn't. The President chose to push a highly partisan stimulus bill instead that the administration said would keep unemployment below 8 percent. And we all know how that turned out. Nearly three years later, the only thing left is the nearly trillion dollars it added to the debt and the government programs it created. And as for jobs, well, unemployment's been above 8 percent for 32 months straight. And according to the Labor Department, there are now 1.5 million fewer jobs than there were then. It's time to try something different. Republicans have proposed a number of ideas that would not only represent a change in direction, but which would also attract broad bipartisan support. There is no good reason whatsoever for the President and Democrats in Congress to pre prevent us from doing these things. As I see it, the President actually has a choice. He can spend the next 13 months trying to get Republicans to vote against legislation that won't create sustainable private sector jobs and which is designed to fail in Congress, or he can work with us on legislation that will actually encourage small business to create jobs and is actually designed to pass. There's an entire menu of bipartisan job-promoting proposals the President could choose to pursue over the next year. Republicans hope he works with us to approve them. Americans are waiting. We're ready to act. The free trade agreements we're voting on tonight are a good first step. They demonstrate the way Washington can actually help tackle the jobs crisis, not by spending borrowed money to create temporary jobs. Spending borrowed money to create temporary jobs, we have tried that. This will lower barriers to private enterprise, unleashing the power of the private sector to make and sell products, expand market share, and in doing so create sustainable private sector jobs that won't disappear when the federal cash spigot runs dry. But if we're going to tackle the enormous challenges we face, we need to do much more than that. With these trade agreements, we're showing we can work together to create jobs and help the economy. We can and must do more of this kind of thing. Madam President, I yield the floor. 
Under the previous order, the leadership time is reserved. Under the previous order, the Senate will consider H.R. 3080, H.R. 3079, and H.R. 3078 en bloc, notwithstanding the lack of receipt of the papers from the House of Representatives. Under the previous order, there will be up to 12 hours for debate, with the time equally divided and controlled between the two leaders or their designees. I suggest the opposite quorum. Clerk will call roll. Mr. Akaka. that the quorum call be set aside. Without objection. Madam President, I come to the floor today uh, thankfully for the last time, I hope, in support of the pending free trade agreements with Korea, Panama, and Colombia. Uh, now for nearly three years, we've heard the administration say the right things, yet there were countless delays. It's been 1,566 days since the U.S.-Korea free trade agreement was signed. 1,568 days for the Panama Agreement and 1,786 days since we completed negotiations with Colombia. Finally, though, I believe the waiting has ended and the administration took action and has submitted these agreements for a vote. I'm eager to vote for all three FTAs this evening and to see their job-creating power in action. By the administration's own estimates, these agreements will spur a quarter of a million new jobs. We should all be able to agree that the benefits of trade are significant. In my home state, in Nebraska alone, more than 19,000 jobs and more than $5.5 billion in revenue are directly tied to exports in this last year. And with these agreements, these statistics will only improve. Nebraska is a big agricultural state, and these three agreements eliminate tariffs and other barriers on most agricultural products, including beef, corn, soybeans, and pork, all products grown in Nebraska. In fact, according to the Farm Bureau and economic analysis from the USDA, Full implementation of these agreements will result in nearly $2.5 billion increase in U.S. ag exports each year. Now, in Nebraska, this increase in agricultural exports is expected to total about $125 million per year and add another 1,100 jobs to our state. The benefits for my home state are not hard to see. In fact, they'd be hard to miss. As the nation's fourth largest exporter of feed grains and a key beef state, US -Korea, the U.S.-Korea agreement holds great opportunity and promise for Nebraska. It el immediately eliminates duties on nearly two-thirds of U.S. agricultural exports to Korea. U.S. exports of corn for feed enter at zero duty, zero duty immediately. For the second largest corn state, 
That's a significant leveling of the playing field. And it phases out the 40% tariff on beef, beef muscle meats and the 18% tariff on variety meats. The Columbia Agreement offers great opportunity to both manufacturing and the agriculture sector. Just one example, Nebraska manufactures and exports irrigation pivots to customers all over the world. Currently, Columbia imposes a 15% duty on pivots, which would be eliminated by this trade agreement. This will allow Nebraska manufacturers to compete on a level playing field with European com companies. The Columbia Agreement also eliminates barriers for many Nebraska ag products, including beef, corn, soybeans, pork, and wheat. In particular, the agreement immediately, immediately eliminates the 80% duty on some of the most important products to the U.S. beef industry, prime and choice cuts of meat. The Columbia Agreement eliminates all tariffs on wheat and barriers on corn and on soybeans. Now, unfortunately, during these years of delay that I referenced at the start of my comments this morning, negotiators for other countries saw an opportunity. Negotiators from the European Union, Argentina, and Canada saw a void that the U.S. companies, workers, and farmers should have been filling and they acted. As a result, our exporters now face even greater competition in these markets. For example, when the Columbia-U.S. agreement was signed, American wheat farmers supplied 70% of the Colombian market. In 2010, U.S. wheat growers supplied only 45% of that market. During that time, the U.S. lost market share in Colombia to competitors like Argentina and Canada, who did not wait on the sidelines and now they enjoy duty-free access. Because of unnecessary delays, our farmers have lost out in markets that they dominated when this agreement was signed. But if we act quickly, if we pass these agreements tonight, U.S. producers can work to build back market share. Madam President, I am confident that Nebraska farmers, businesses, and workers, and those around the country, well, they can compete with anybody in the world. And in doing so, we can create jobs here at home. By the administration's estimates, the Korea, Colombia, and Panama free trade agreements will create, as I have referenced, 250,000 U.S. jobs. Now, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce took a broader view, and they have an estimate of 380,000 jobs to be created. But either number is worth celebrating. In May, the President called for a, quote, robust, forward-looking trade agenda that emphasizes exports and domestic job growth, unquote. And I'm glad that the President has turned these words into action on these long overdue job creating agreements. These three bipartisan votes should have been near the top of the agenda three years ago. By now, we should be voting on new agreements that this administration has negotiated, not the leftover work of the past administration. During the challenging economic times our nation has endured, we should have been exerting every ounce of energy to get our economy going. That is not done by heavy-handed government regulation, massive, unsustainable new government spending. It is accomplished, though, by lowering and removing barriers so our job creators can flourish in a global environment. That's what we have today, an opportunity to give our job creators a chance to flourish in the global environment. We cannot ignore the fastest growing opportunities for American businesses, farms, and ranchers are not in the United States or outside our borders. They're overseas in rapidly developing countries where 95% of the world population lives. I sincerely hope that these long delays have not hurt our ability to negotiate high quality trade agreements. 
But more importantly, I hope it does not hurt the ability of Americans to compete in these growing markets. I look forward to, the, to working with the administration over the rest of this Congress on forward-looking trade efforts. Real progress forward would produce even more opportunities. I am optimistic this morning. I'm optimistic that my colleagues on both sides of the aisle will join me in voting in favor of the trade agreements with Korea, Panama, and Colombia. Together, we can allow hardworking Americans to create jobs here at home. I hope these three agreements are the beginning, not the end. Madam President, following today's votes, we should rejoice in, a, in an accomplishment, but more work remains to be done. And I'm prepared to tackle this endeavor just as I did when I was Secretary of Agriculture. For the sake of our nation, I hope to find willing partners today on these three votes and in the future of more trade agreements and additional opportunities. Madam President, I yield the floor and I note the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Kaka. Senator from Nebraska. I ask uh, that the quorum call be set aside. Without objection. And Madam President, I ask consent that all time during the quorum calls be divided equally. Without objection. Madam President, I uh, yield the floor to note the absence of the quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka. Madam President. Madam President, I ask that the uh, quorum call be initiated. Without objection. Good morning. Good morning. I was on the, uh, the phone uh, uh, earlier this week with a friend back in, in Delaware, and uh, we were talking about uh, these free trade agreements negotiated by, by the uh, Bush administration and fine-tuned by the Obama administration. My friend said, uh, why do we have free trade agreements anyway? And uh, I said, let's just go back a little bit in time. At the end of World War II, uh, when the baby boomers and my sister and I came along, the, uh, the U.S. was on, we were on top of the world. Uh, our uh, industrial infrastructure was strong. Uh, we uh, were a vibrant uh, economy. We come out of the uh, Great uh, Depression uh, with all uh, guns blazing. And uh, a lot of the rest of the world lay in ruins. And some of, the na some of the nations that would go on to become our, our greatest uh, competitors, and that includes China, some others as well, uh, Korea, um, and others uh, were in the midst of wars of their own and, and uh, eventually would be, be governed, at least in part, in uh, Korea by uh, communists, in a communist form of uh, government. And um, so the competition wasn't that, uh, wasn't that great. And then the uh, things started to change, and the uh, the competition got uh, got a whole lot stronger. I remember uh, when I was a kid growing up, it had been at Christmas time, and we were opening presents around the tree. Uh, where I grew up in Danville, Virginia, and we received a, a present, uh, just a knickknack or something from from uh, friends of our family, and and my father turned it over and it said like made in Japan. And he and my, my mom kind of sneered at that and as if it were like unworthy of us. And why would somebody send us anything made in, in Japan? So things really have changed and, uh, in some ways for the better and in other ways maybe not. But for a long time we uh, were the 800 pound gorilla in the room. In terms of auto sales, I think we had about 90% of the domestic auto, auto, uh, our domestic auto producers had about 90% of the market share here in the U.S., maybe more than that. Uh, well into uh, the latter part of, uh, of the last century. Now we don't. Uh, our market share is, uh, in cars at least, is less than 50 percent. The quality is good, but the market share is, is less. Uh, if you look at uh, the amount of uh, cars that come to us from Korea, they roughly export uh, uh, 500,000 uh, vehicles to the U.S. this year, last year, next year. We will export barely 5,000 to them. Think about that. Roughly for every one uh, American car that we sell, they, they sell us about 100. 
And that, that's not free trade. And as it turns out, it's not fair trade either. And what they do is, is they don't put tariffs on our cars. But what they do is they have non-tariff barriers, really clever ways to keep our vehicles out. And it could do with the deal with the environmental uh, equipment on the car, the exhaust systems, it could be the fuel system, the transmissions, you name it. They find all kinds of ways to keep our vehicles out. We don't do that. We don't play that game. And they take advantage of, uh, of that. We want to, to sell uh, poultry in a place like Panama. And in Panama, we, uh, you know, here in this country, a lot of people like eat uh, white meat of the chicken. Overseas, a lot of people eat dark meat. And so it's a nice opportunity for us to export uh, the dark meat. And if, if we want to uh, export leg quarters, which is a drumstick and a thigh, down to Panama, and normally a, a packet of, uh, of uh, leg quarters that would cost 10 bucks here, there's a 260% tariff for those leg quarters, leg quarters going into uh, to Panama. So the Panamanian family would be asked to pay 36 bucks. Uh, I don't know what that translates into pesos, but uh, 20, 36 bucks for $10 worth of, of, uh, of chicken. We uh, allow countries, whether it's Korea or Panama or Colombia or just about any other nation, to sell the goods and products in our country at will, without much at all in, in the way of barriers, without impediment, without tariff barriers, without non-tariff barriers. They impose barriers uh, against us. And the reason why really flows from the situation we were in at the end of World War II, when we were su such a juggernaut, such an economic juggernaut. And other countries wanted to try to protect their markets, at least a little bit, from the 800-pound gorilla in the world, that was us. And while we're still a, a strong and a vibrant nation, we no longer dominate uh, the world markets as we once did. But what we do want is to have, as we continue to let other people sell here, we want to make sure that we have access to the markets in, in ways that uh, we haven't had in, in some countries in, in recent, uh, recent years. I like to, I like to think of uh, what are the roles of government, and one of the major roles of government is to provide a, what I call a nurturing environment for job creation, job preservation, and uh, that includes a lot of things. That includes access to credit, making sure businesses large and small have access to credit. It means that, uh, that when folks uh, come up with an idea that we have an innovative uh, 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 economy and a lot of technology, and when people come up with a new idea, new technology, they go to the patent office to file it, they actually end up getting the patent. And they don't end up in years of, of litigation. Uh, businesses like predictability and certainty, that's part of the environment we need to provide. We need to provide a workforce uh, where uh, work people, the people coming out of our, our schools uh, can read, can write, can think, can do math, and are comfortable with tech, uh, technology, have good work ethic. We have to have common sense in our regulations. Obviously, we need regulations, but we need to consider cost-benefit relations. And as we do those, uh, do those uh, uh, regulations and get input from uh, all sides, we need uh, predictable tax policy and, and tax policy that is, uh, that is pro-growth. And uh, we also need uh, access to foreign markets. Uh, folks who build things in this country need access to foreign markets. And in too many cases, we don't have that. And these are the trade agreements attempt to change that. And uh, very soon, the, uh, the family down in Panama that weighs wants to pay has to pay now 36 bucks for that um, same amount of uh, drum, drumsticks and thighs that uh, now cost 10 bucks here, that's going to change. And we're going to start exporting and selling cars in Korea. They'll still be able to sell here, but we'll be selling tens of thousands uh, of cars in Korea in, in a year or two. We, in my state, we used to make a lot of cars. We had a GM plant, a Chrysler plant. GM plant's gone, Chrysler plant is gone, but uh, starting late next year, a new Fisker plant will start up, and we'll be making some of the most beautiful cars in the world. They're already making some of them in Finland called the Karma. They get about 70 miles per gallon, drop-dead beautiful vehicles, and they, uh, they'll be making a, a less expensive version of that car starting in the ne late next year in, in, in Delaware. And we want to make sure that they, they'll be able to use our uh, auto port at the Port of Wilmington to ship those cars around the world. They expect to export half of what they built. Be nice to sell some of those to Korea. Be nice to sell some of down in, in the Latin America and South America as well as back in, 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 in Europe. But out of this agreement for my state, 80% uh, of our uh, agricultural industry is, believe it or not, chickens. 80%. I don't know what it's like in Iowa uh, or in Florida, 
but 80% or New York, but 80% of our ag industry is chicken. Well, ag is actually one of our top three, agriculture is one of our top three uh, sectors of our economy in our state, so it's a big deal. 80% uh, of chicken, one out of every five uh, chickens we raise on the Delmarva Peninsula are exported to other countries. And so it's a, it's, this is a big, a big, a big deal. It's not chicken feed. This is, this is a big deal for us in, in, uh, in Delaware. So uh, for us, this is important for the ability to export uh, vehicles, uh, the ability to export chemicals and plastics, uh, poultry, the, the ability for us to, to, uh, to uh, export some of our services that work. And the, the work that we do in financial services with banking or, or insurance, and a lot of those uh, companies would like to be able to do business in whether it's Korea or, or Latin America. And, and uh, this legislation will enable them to do that. A lot, I think a lot of people are going to vote for the, the agreements uh, today on uh, trade agreements with uh, Panama. I think a lot of people are going to vote uh, for the agreement w with, uh, with South Korea. Even some of our labor unions, think UAW, United Food and Commercial Workers, support the South Korean agreement. There's, uh, there's still uh, some, some skepticism, some concern, understandable, understandable concern with the agreement uh, with uh, Colombia. And uh, as everybody in this chamber knows, and a lot of people in this country know, for years, uh, labor leaders, labor organizers, have been the target of assassination in uh, Colombia. According to Colombia's figures in uh, 2001, I believe there are about 205 uh, assassinations just in that one year alone in, uh, in Colombia. And the, uh, believe, the, the numbers are, uh, a little bit uh, confusing because uh, that includes folks who are not necessarily labor organizers, but people who, in some cases, are educators. They may be members of, of labor unions. But uh, 205 people in one year. Can you imagine in this country if 205 uh, labor uh, leaders, or labor organizers, or teachers were murdered in a year? And that's a much smaller country than, than, than ours. It's a huge number. And the numbers have come, back, come down. And, one of our conversations yesterday with some of our labor leaders back in Delaware, one of them shared with me the number uh, reported by the Colombian government this year is, I think, 22 as of the, the early part of this uh, month. That's 22 too many. And apparently about half of those uh, folks that have been killed are, are teachers who have been targeted by criminal uh, elements there, the drug, uh, the drug folks, drug uh, gangs, because the, the threat that, that each te teachers, educators pose to their ability to of the drug uh, folks to dis the unstabilize, destabilize, destabilize uh, that country. And so they're a target as well. The Colombia government has uh, provided, I, I kind of describe it as like, almost like a wit uh, witness protection service uh, down there, but it's, it's different. They, they don't actually take people and change their identity and, and move them off to another part of the country and hide them, uh, but they actually provide uh, extra protection for folks who are believed to be at, at risk. And that has caused a reduction by almost 90% in the assassinations over the last decade. But even if it's just two or one, uh, we all know that that's too many. The question for, for a lot of us is, do we uh, ignore the progress? Or, and, or, or do we say, no, we're, we're not going to uh, ratify a free trade agreement with uh, Colombia until there's like no uh, assassinations? We have an old saying around, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. I. Uh, that may trivialize this, this particular uh, argument, and I wouldn't suggest that that's the, the standard that we use. But uh, substantial progress has been made. We have embedded in that uh, uh, trade agreement uh, environmental provisions, labor provisions that are now part of the agreement. We've done the same thing with Panama and with, uh, and with uh, Korea. There is an um, implementation schedule for that the Colombian government is expected to follow, has been following, it's been certified by the president. They're actually doing the step, taking the steps that they're supposed to be taking, they've agreed to take, in order to further reduce the, the level of violence. And, uh, uh, and overall, rather extraordinary progress has been made in Colombia. A friend of mine who, who works down there, is in the embassy, been down there an earlier tour, I think a decade or so ago, uh, describes to me the differences between night and day. And it wasn't uh, all that long ago when some gunmen rounded up, uh, I think, 11 Supreme Court justices in Colombia, took them into a room and shot them all dead. Shot them all dead. So we know that uh, it's not just teachers, we know it's not just labor leaders and, that are being targeted for assassination, have been targeted for assassination, but literally people at the highest level of uh, that, uh, that country's uh, government. Government leaders, people who run for office, office holders, uh, law enforcement officers, judges, 
all kinds of people have been. And uh, for the most part, it's, it's changed. It's a whole lot, uh, whole lot better. And the question is, do we reward the improvement that's been made, or do we just say, no, that's not enough. We'll come back when you're you know, pristine, pristine clean, clean, pristine pure. And for, for me, it's, uh, it's one I wrestled, uh, wrestled with. I know others have as well. But I think in this case, uh, we, uh, we vote for our hopes. And our hope is, uh, and our expectation is that progress has been realized. We'll, we'll continue. I, uh, Madam, uh, Madam President, I think one, one last thing I want to mention before I finish. <clears throat> uh, any number of folks, folks have said to me, uh, you know, NAFTA didn't really help us all that much. You know, Mexico and, and, and Canada. And how do we know that these trade agreements won't help us uh, either? And uh, there's a, a couple, we've learned some things from NAFTA. And one of the things we learned is uh, we ought, if we have environmental uh, concerns, we ought to embed uh, an agreement in addressing those environmental concerns actually in the treaty. We've done that with all three nations. We've done the same thing uh, with respect to, to labor uh, provisions. They're actually embedded in the agreement. Uh, the other thing that, uh, the other thing that, uh, that I've said to, to, to folks who are just really concerned that we're not going to, this isn't really in our, in our best interest and it's not going to help us economically. I don't agree with that. But think about it as, as I say, really, to, to, to say this is not going to help us is really counterintuitive. Think about it. We allow these countries to sell their goods and services in our country without impediment. We don't keep them out. We don't impose, for the most part, tariff barriers and non-tariff barriers. But we want to sell our, our stuff there. They impose these barriers, tariff or non-tariff barriers. Under a free trade agreement, the barriers that others put up to keep our goods and services out pretty much go away. In some cases, pretty fast. And it's hard for me to, to say, well, if we're, we're going to let uh, them sh ship their goods and services to us, continue to, and they're going to eliminate their tariff barriers and non-tariff barriers, why shouldn't we do better? We'll do better. We make great chicken. We may build great cars. We have uh, great uh, chemical products and excellent financial services. Those products will sell, and we'll be able to grow our economy. Last, last comment is this. For us to, to come out of this uh, recession, is in, we, we've come out of the recession officially, but it's, there's still a lot of hurt and a lot of pain all over the place, including my own state. But for us to, to really come out of it, we need to grow the economy. We need to grow the economy. And uh, we need to grow it across the world. We make any number of uh, things uh, in this country, and there, some of them are products, cars, chickens, uh, chemicals, plastics. Others are services. They're, they're as good as any in the world. We want to make sure we have access to sell them anywhere in the world, including these three countries. Their consumers will be better off, and our producers, our businesses, will be better off. And that is why I'm happy to, to support these, uh, these agreements. Last thing I want to say, I just want to acknowledge the, uh, the, uh, the excellent leadership that Senator Bacchus has provided for us. Senator Grass, who's on the floor, and his, this is an issue, these are issues that he cares a lot about. And the partnership that he and Senator Grass, he and Senator Bacchus have had over the years, I think, is really a model for, for the United States Senate. And uh, they're, they're not on the floor right now, but I also want to mention uh, Senator Blunt and Senator Portman, our, two of our Republican colleagues, who who joined with, uh, with me to, to make sure at the end of the day we didn't just vote for three uh, free trade agreements, but they also had the opportunity to, to vote and to put in place trade adjustment assistance to ensure that those workers in this country who might be displaced or might be negatively affected uh, would have uh, the opportunity to get uh, unemployment uh, compensation, to have the opportunity to get uh, job training so that they would be treated fairly as well. It's really the personification of the golden rule. Treat other people the way we'd want to be treated. And uh, we, we succeed in not just passing three, three, three free trade agreements, which I think will help overall for our economy, but we're also going to look after the people who might uh, be adversely affected. And I want to thank uh, Senator Grassley and uh, the other Republicans uh, who uh, provide the support to make that happen, too. And again, to, to Senator Bacchus, job well done. Madam Chair, thank you. Thank you so much. And I, uh, I don't know if anyone else is here to, to, to speak at this time. Senator Grassley. Mr. Pre Madam President. Senator from Iowa. Well, can you believe it? We're finally here. After several years of waiting for these trade agreements to come to the Congress, looks like we're going to be able to vote on them, pass them, and the President sign them, and they become law. 
Quite frankly, I thought soon after May the 10th, 2007, we'd be voting on the Colombian trade agreement because uh, President Bush was anxious to send it to the Hill. But uh, the Democrats took over the Congress in, after the 2006 election. And the way that it was negotiated by the Bush administration, it wasn't good enough. Uh, it wasn't enough negotiation go far enough on labor and on environment. So the new Democrat-controlled Congress said we've got to do more on those negotiations for environment and labor. So more was renegotiated. And on May the 10th, 2007, there was a news conference announcing a bipartisan uh, results that between the Bush administration and the Democrat Congress that uh, uh, there was an agreement on Columbia that had been reached on better environment and labor issues. So a bipartisan agreement, particularly when you have a Democrat Congress and a Republican president, you would expect, well, right away, we're going to have at least Colombia up here. At that time, South Korea wasn't completely negotiated. Well, uh, the other party turned into a protectionist party, and nothing has happened until now. Uh, the goalposts have been moved several times. But uh, the free trade reality of uh, creating jobs has come back to the other political party. And so I'm glad we're here at least now, maybe four years later, but still doing the right thing, even though it's done later than it should have been done. Now, everybody knows that every day in this Congress, and rightly so, with nine and one-tenth one percent unemployment, the topic every day is jobs. And that's as, as it should be. The question gets asked a lot what policies can we implement here in the Congress to create jobs, or at least to encourage jobs? And with over 9 percent unemployment in this country, we should, in fact, be talking about how to have an environment that creates jobs. Freeing up trade is one of the best ways to create jobs. And these aren't just creating jobs. These are good-paying jobs, because on average, jobs related to international trade pay 15 percent above the national average. The truth is that for years we have known one clear and simple way to create jobs and stimulate growth in our economy, and that is international trade. Colombia, South Korea, Panama, will create and support thousands of jobs, and I say even hundreds of thousands of jobs. So we must implement the trade deals reached with Panama, South Korea, Colombia, and do it today even though it should have been done in the case of South Korea a year ago, in the case of Panama and Colombia three or four years ago. We entered into these agreements back in 2006 and 2007, and there's no excuse why we have to wait five years till now to get to them. Yet, congressional Democrats and later President Obama continued to move the goalposts, putting up barriers that prevented their consideration and passage till this day. There is no clearer or easier way of creating jobs in the near term and good jobs lasting for a long period of time than passing these trade bills and doing it now. And thank God the President has said that he would sign them. According to the National Association of Manufacturers, 100,000 jobs will be created by the implementation of these trade agreements. There are estimates from other sources that suggest the number of jobs may be even higher. And the administration, and I believe rightly so, believes that 
that, that a higher number of jobs being created would be in a few hundred thousand. The Obama administration estimates that in the case of Korea trade agreement alone, 70,000 additional jobs for the U.S. workforce will be created. Not only do these trade agreements expand opportunities for U.S. workers, they also tre present tremendous opportunities for American agriculture. It is estimated that the Korean uh, agreement could increase the price that farmers receive for pigs by $10 per head. So you see in the case of Delaware, Senator Carper says that it's good for his poultry industry that's so dominant there, where larger livestock is so dominant in the Midwest, in my state of Iowa, it's going to be a very good agreement as well. The Colombian agreement will level the playing field for U.S. corn farmers so that they can begin to reclaim some of the market share that they lost due to high tariffs for our products going down there, but also even though we've lost markets, not just because of the high tariffs, but because Colombia in the last five years has reached agreements with other countries that have allowed those countries through their agricultural products, particularly grain, to take over such a share of the Colombian market that previously American agriculture had. The agreement with the country of Panama will bring about better opportunities for a variety of agricultural products, including beef, poultry, pork, just to name a few. We have been waiting a long time to get to this point, and so, as I've said two or three times, because I'm satisfied that we're going to get the job done, I'm eager to cast my vote in support of all three agreements. But as the finish line nears on these agreements, the American people should be asking why President Obama has dragged his feet on these agreements for so long. Because there's been a lot of wasted time and tax dollars with stimulus programs that were supposed to create jobs but did not produce any measurable amount of jobs. Whereas if these agreements had been in place, these jobs we're talking about creating this day forward would probably have already been created. The stimulus plan failed to do what President Obama promised Americans, but I'm telling you these trade agreements will do what President Obama promises the American people they'll do in the way of creating jobs. Now, of course, the President wants to try it again with yet another costly stimulus program as we were debating yesterday. We don't need more government spending to create jobs. We know that doesn't work. What we need to do is create an environment so that the private sector will create jobs. So we know what works, and these agreements is part of what it works to create jobs. We need to continue opening markets for U.S. exports, and that's what these agreements will do. We need to pass these trade agreements and do it now. American workers need them now, and the unemployed need those new jobs that will be created as a result of these. But for the economic future of our country, we should not stop with these three trade agreements. The President can provide certainty to businesses, farmers, and workers by renewing his commitment to expanding trade opportunities. The best way to do that is to ask Congress to renew his authority to negotiate free trade agreements through a process long used. Cooperation between the Congress and the executive branch of government by Congress giving the President what's called trade promotion authority so he can work further agreements. In January of 2010, the President said he wanted to do to double exports by 2015, and that is welcome news. But actions speak louder than words, Mr. President. The President repeatedly delayed these trade deals. He has routinely dodged the question when he would request 
authority for trade promotion uh, to negotiate those agreements, and he has not laid out a clear strategic plan for, in fact, reaching his own trade goals that he expressed at the beginning of 2010. We are now nearly two years further down the road from that discussion he had. While it may be tough to reach the goals of doubling exports by 2015, we can still push on towards that goal as we should. The more we do to open new markets and then get out of the way, the more we will help our struggling economy. There are three steps to continue helping U.S. businesses, farmers, and most of all, the workers of America, and particularly the unemployed workers of America. First, pass these three trade agreements with no more political gamemanship by this administration, and I think we're over that hurdle. Secondly, Congress should pass trade promotion authority so the administration can responsibly seek out opportunities for greater market access for U.S. products. And finally, the administration make it a top priority to actually seek out more opportunities for opening foreign markets for our products. We live in a global economy. We once led the way of forming trade agreements and expanding trade relationships. The rest of the world waited for the United States to take the first step. But in recent years, we've lost our way. The rest of the world isn't going to wait on the United States as they did for those 60 years. That's why we've lost market share to Colombia that I just spoke about as one example. We need to reestablish our position as a world leader in opening and expanding markets. Passing these trade agreements is crucial and long overdue, but it's a necessary first step. The next step is for the president to seek trade promotion authority and get back in the game leading the rest of the world. I urge my colleagues then to help U.S. businesses, farmers, and our workers, and most importantly, our unemployed workers, by voting in support of Panama, Colombia, and South Korea trade agreements. I yield the floor.